everybody. My name is Nidhi Shastri. Um, I'm a second year educator in social justice education, and I do a lot of activism work on campus. Hello, my name is Tommy Shi. I am a senior double majoring in history and Asian American studies. I am the president and you know, one of the founders of the Last Student Association. Um, and today our presentation is called Becoming Asian American. So we're going to start by talk, uh, telling people about ourselves before we came to college. So a little bit about myself. I was born in Hazelwood, Missouri, uh, and then moved to Othello, Missouri. So uh, for reference, they're close to St. Louis. They're about 30, 40 minutes away. Um, in my um, second neighborhood of Othello, and it was a primarily white neighborhood, 85%. So um, I didn't get a chance to interact much with people of color in my school. And then um, even in my family, I noticed when growing up, um, somewhere along the line that um, both sides of my family were somewhat different. Um, one side was um, Chinese, the other side was Lao Chinese. I didn't realize the cultural and um, ideological differences. It was, it was very striking when I learned um, how my families or both sides came to the US. And um, at least in my family, I'd never learned um, the, the Lao side that well. So. I was very confused of why exactly they came here, why they don't talk about their past, and uh, I didn't really learn about that side of my identity until college. And I actually didn't even have a chance to interact with other Southeast Asian Americans until late high school. And um, that's definitely influenced me a lot um, in my interactions in college. And um, the way um, this, my upbringing affect me in any way, I would say definitely so. It made me. Um, not being able to interact with people who identified as me it made me kind of slightly aware of the issues. Um, and in college, I definitely made an effort to reverse that, but in my last year, I made it, made it also an effort to interact with non-Asian Americans as well. And um, these are just some aspirations I had before coming to college. So when I got into school here, I applied to maybe um, 10 something um, universities. And um, ultimately it came down to this school in Purdue. Um, I withdrew my application from UW-Madison, so that was also a contender for the longest. But I know in high school, my senior year, I went to start up an Asian American club. Our school only had about 13 Asians at the time that I went, <coughs> 23 Asians, so it was a very low number. I wanted to get people, uh, Asian Americans and Asians together. It wasn't really too feasible by the time I wanted to do it because I was graduating. No one would have been able to continue the work that I would have started. And um, that's kind of led to um, creating um, the Lao Sin Association. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to meet more Southeast Asians and um, Asian Americans. Um, like I said earlier, I didn't really learn much about my family history, at least my dad's side, so. I wanted to learn more and um, the first friend I made in junior year of high school, that friend um, whose parents also came as refugees from um, the Vietnam War, it was very helpful learning. And um, it made me learn that um, I should be proud of my history and not ashamed of it. Um, yeah, in general, I wanted to learn more about myself. So I only knew about half or maybe three quarters of my identity and not really the last quarter. And um, yeah, in general, I just wanted to be more social in college. I, um, didn't really have the best call from high school experience, so I wanted to make more friends here and find somewhere that I could belong. Um, so for me, these are just some places that I've lived throughout my life. So I was born in Elmhurst, which is outside of Chicago. My family is from Ahmedabad, which is a city, a really big city, in Gujarat, India, which is like northwest India. Um, so they first, my dad first came with his brother and moved to the Bronx um, in New York City and then they moved to Chicago. Um, I grew up in Arlington Heights, and then I grew up in Hoffman Estates. I have family members who lived on Devon Avenue, which is known as like India Town in Chicago, if you guys are familiar. Um, as well as I've lived in Roscoe Village for two years on and off, so. There was kind of like this erasure of identity growing up. Like, I remember my sister and her friends were talking once about Bollywood Club at our school, 
and they were like, I'm not joining Bollywood Club, that's social suicide. And I was like, oh my god, like, I'm not joining Bollywood Club, you know? And so, <laughs> so there was like this want to kind of erase my brownness, or to kind of keep it on the down low and make it not so obvious so that I could fit in better with my peers at school. In high school and in elementary school, I think that's true. Um, I grew up with a strong Desi Muslim presence as well, and I'm Hindu personally, but my mom's best friend growing up was Muslim, or is Muslim, um, and she actually converted from Hinduism to Islam. And so through that, I basically understood Muslim culture as well as Hindu culture and how related they were in the context of being Gujarati and being Indian and how our culture is very, very similar and even the cultural things that we practice through our religion become very similar in that sense. Um, so my best friend, um, her family is also Muslim and they're from Guyana, if you guys are familiar with Guyana. Um, they're from British Guyana. And so I kind of grew up like under celebrating Ramzan and breaking Roja with the family, so like breaking fast and celebrating Ramadan and stuff. And so these are very fundamental experiences in addition to like my own experiences growing up praying at Hindu temples and like understanding Hinduism in general um, and what that means for my identity and for my lifestyle. Um, and then I think being vegetarian also had to do with that in terms of it being a way of life. Like Hinduism is a way of life, Islam is a way of life. So um, coexistence and I think there was also a racial barrier growing up um, so close to Muslim families of being perceived as Muslim, but not being such. And I think that's true for a lot of brown people because a lot of times people don't take time to find the nuance or they don't take time to understand the different backgrounds people can be from. Instead, they just kind of paint you all as the same thing. And because of that, there were a lot of like <coughs> racist things that happened, like people um, threw lava rocks through windows. There was like racially motivated attacks when I was growing up. Um, which were not uncommon in my area. So we're gonna talk a little bit about like the demographics of our school growing up to just to show the different backgrounds that we're from. So this is my high school, this is my elementary school, sorry. So it was 19.4% white, 2.8% two or more races, 24.7% Asian, 33.5% Hispanic, and 19.6% black. So I came from a very, very, just fundamentally diverse school. Um, we had almost everybody, and that reflected in my upbringing. You know, I was used to seeing people of color, and I was used to growing up around different cultures and languages and identities. Oh, and then uh, my elementary school, um, MG Elementary School, as you can see here, there's 83% um, white people. Um, all the others don't even know. Um, they only make up about 13%. So. Um, I know when I was in classes, it was rare to have maybe one or two of people of color. And um, even then, we didn't really talk about our identities. Or we were young, but even then, we didn't really talk about um, that stuff because it was kind of frowned down upon. Or even bringing food that was um, that wasn't American, quote unquote, was also just people would catch you weird. Yeah, and I'll note that even though my um, elementary school and as we'll see my high school was very diverse we still had the same stigma like if you brought your ethnic food or you were speaking your language other people would understand it because they came from like backgrounds similarly but that overarching theme of like hide your identity don't embrace who you are kind of took over um, this is my high school it's 32.6 percent white 11.9 percent black 31.3 percent hispanic 19.9 percent asian and then um 0.3% Native American, two or more races is 3.9%, and then 0.2% Pacific Islander. So again, very diverse area. And um, compared to my high school, it actually became more white. 4% <laughs> more, 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 more white, and the African American population also increased by 2%, but even then, finding people of color, I guess, because by high school we were divided into um, how we tested in classes. So, then I started interacting more with Asian Americans, but still, that wasn't really the primary reason why we were interacting with each other. We still didn't really talk about our <coughs> respective cultures, maybe except for um, some South Asians. They kind of banded together, but other than that, we really didn't get together that often. Um, and then I want to talk about socioeconomic status too. So 49.6% of my school was on free or reduced lunch, and 54% was not. Oh, in my school, there are low percentages, so I wasn't really 
I don't think we were ever taught about um, disadvantage or economics. We were, um, I guess we were taught the basics of subjects, but I didn't really know about disabilities or even special education. I didn't really talk about that either, so I didn't really know how to address the subject whenever it came out. Which is what brings me to like IEP. Um, we have ten percent IEP um, students at our school, and IEP is basically like a sort of graduation path they create for people who have disabilities. Um, and the way that the school categorizes that though is kind of weird. Like they're not really consistent. Um, but I just wanted to give a diversity of different demographics. So, so to our next point and to some of our next slides, I just wanted to talk about some. Lao and Lao American misconceptions. I feel that out of the many um, group, Asian American groups on campus, it's either people haven't heard who we are or they're just misconceptions that they might have heard. So the, mis the first misconception are um, there are many inter international law students. So this point I just made um, made number one because I remember once I was given a presentation and uh, uh, the present the presenter or the person who um, organized and wanted me to focus on international experiences and bring an international speaker. Uh, the thing, at least in our school, there aren't um, many, if any, international students. So when I was making that presentation, I felt like my story was uh, it wasn't valued because I was Latin American. And um, even when I asked them, could I bring a community member, someone who came during the 80s or the 90s, even then, they still wanted international students. So I felt that not only was I kind of devalued um, the people, some of my people from my parents' um, generation are also devalued in, um, during that occasion. Then, Lao Americans are mild minorities, so I want to clarify that mild minorities are, it's not true. It's not true that Asian Americans are um, always the top scoring. Um, they have no problems. They're, they do fine economically. And, um, if you look at the stats, um, Lao Americans actually, and other Southeast Asian Americans actually have very low test scores. Standardized tests, low um, high school education attainments. Um, even I noticed that in my own family, my dad um, never um, got to college. And um, the third misconception is there's one definite Lao and Lao American experience. I speak on this because sometimes when I talk on campus, uh, I notice that I'm given the burden of representation that I'm supposed to represent all Lao Americans. And from my upbringing, I didn't really interact with many. My family didn't interact with um, other Lao Americans. Either, so my experience from a city that didn't have many versus someone from who had a lot, maybe from Elgin or something, is very different. So uh, I, that can also be applied to many other groups as well. And um, the next one is Lao Americans look alike and um, have both the same last names. So I learned um, throughout my time that last names or surnames are they're, they could be a good indicator in some cases of what a person's nationality or ethnicity are, but sometimes they're, they're misleading, but I never um, assume that someone's whatever based on them those. It's a great indicator, but and it's helping find people, but I don't really want to just take those as um, complete indicators. And um, while Americans are a thing of the past, so sometimes um, we don't really talk about the Vietnam War in the U.S. it's kind of seen as a shame, um, the lost war, and um, because we don't talk about that, we also don't talk about the people that were brought over as a result. <coughs> so sometimes when we talk about these is economic issues, um, education issues, Lao Americans and other Southeast Asian Americans are left out of the narrative. And um, even though that those events were about 40 years ago, um, our issues are still present. It's not like we gotten over them somehow magically and became all minorities. And um, the next one is just the, the usage of terms. So I definitely see people, like for my um, student group, it's not the Laos Student Association, it's not the Laotian Student Association. Laos is a name of a country, not a group, not a name of a group of people. Laotian is described, describes all people from um, the country of Laos, but not the specific ethnic group. Plus Laotian is kind of a westernized um, concept. It's the um, word that came from um, French, I think, and Lao is a word that comes from the Lao language itself. So it's kind of a difference of using um, a word someone put onto you and your native word. 
So um, we decided to do a little set about representation and who's left out of the narrative, especially in our experience, because um, we are both seniors on campus. So um, starting out more broadly, South Asians are often perceived to not be actual Asians. So like, for example, if I told somebody like I'm Asian, they'd be like, you're not Asian, you're Indian, you know? And like, so that's like a slight way to sort of like kick people out of the category. Um, there's an added layer of brown skin and religious diversity. And Asian Americans have the highest rate of college education of all minority groups. However, most of these degrees come from community college. So a lot of people assume like Asians are all rich, they all have the money to go to a public university or private university. But most of these people are going to community college and getting those degrees. So that's a large misconception. So then moving on to Southeast Asians. So I, also, I actually mentioned this point earlier about the model minority myth. So I mean, Southeast Asian Americans are sometimes um, asked, oh, you just assume that you're good at math, you're good at um, all these other subjects. You don't need help in um, any personal manner at all, which is not true. Um, because some of us came from refugee backgrounds, it's uh, family, it's kind of hard to express um, types of feelings and emotions and problems to people. And yeah, this uh, are you Japanese or Chinese? I once actually got that question. Um, when I was um, um, on a lift ride from um, somewhere in Massachusetts by a South Asian, Asian driver, so I was, just, I was not shocked that I was asked, but I was more um, okay. I, I was kind of shocked because it came from like, <laughs> it came from a South Asian person, someone who I thought would actually maybe know some knowledge, and then they're like, they asked me, "Oh, what's Laos? I don't know what that is. So, are you Chinese or Korean?" So I was just I don't know. I was too tired to really um, educate the person at the time. <laughs> and um, yeah, I talked about education status and attainment. While Americans and other Southeast Asian Americans, they're actually lower. They can be compared to some um, um, African American and Latin, Latinx um, rates when the data is disaggregated. And the mixed identities, so I come from a multi-ethnic background, so sometimes um, I do get the um, feeling that I don't belong in one group, and then again, I okay, I don't have that feeling with my other group of um, being loud. But sometimes with Chinese, I just don't feel like, even though I am mostly Chinese, I don't think I fit in, um, and not because I purposely make it so. It just happens that way. The group that just makes it. So. Yeah. So we decided to beg the question, like, why are we feeling this way? Why don't we feel like we fit into the larger narrative of being Asian? Um, so we did a little investigation. And we pulled up a few organizations that are supposed to be representative of all like Asian American identities, one of which is Asian American Association. But if you look at a picture of their board, you don't really see any South Asian faces. And so this is like a problem, as well as Southeast Asian, as Tommy has expressed. Actually, I was doing some research. AAA does have one Southeast Asian though board member, but, but the thing is, at least for me, that person doesn't really represent me. I mean, we're not from the same country of origin or the same really part of Southeast Asia either, so. It's, um, I still don't find representation even though that is um, the case. And um, going on with the story, I guess one thing I've noticed about the AAA events is um, there's so many people in that student group and um, every time I go, it's um, I see people I don't know and I've gone to events in the past where just no one acknowledges my presence, no one even um, talks to me, not even the bo uh, board members. And then sometimes when I tell them that I'm Lao, or Lao and Chinese, they kind of just, um, they're more interested in the Chinese part, so they kind of don't care about the Lao part, so. I've definitely had instances just where my, um, one of my identities was ignored by talking to members, so. Sometimes going to their events is, I kind of know, some of them won't know, aren't knowledgeable, and even if they are knowledgeable, they don't really care that much either. And for me, like, I feel like it's hard to get your foot in the door because there's no connection. Like, there's no other South Asian, South Asian person I can talk to or relate to or even go to an event, like, celebrating South Asian culture because it's just not represented. Um, that's also represented in the Asian American Student Housing Organization. So they actually don't have a general body, so the board is it. Like, the board creates all the events and does all the programming. but. Um, I've actually been in contact with them, and they do have one Southeast Asian um, board member, but they have no South Asian board members. And because of that, in housing, sometimes we have this problem of like not giving equal representation when we talk about Asian, and we don't really distribute the proper resources to celebrate like Eid or celebrate 
I know we do do the Bali celebration sometimes, but I tried to do, I tried to be a part of that, and I found that it was very difficult for me to, and I ended up not being a part of it. So um, I think there's just a really big lack of representation for South and Southeast Asians, and I feel like we're making strides, but if we don't have visual representation, then we can't surpass that. We can't really change the system and have full representation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Indian Student Association. So along with like AAA and um, ASHO, I think that change needs to come from within. So for the South Asian community in specific, I have found that ISA is not very social justice friendly, and as a social justice educator, that's something I'm really passionate about. And so um, I feel like from my own community, we need to look within ourselves and talk about this. Um, it stratifies the Indian diaspora. So it's not very representative of Muslim Indians, Indo-Caribbeans and Indians who don't fit the typical narrative. So um, there's also like a socioeconomic status differential where like you have to pay a certain amount of fee to be part of the club or the RSO every semester, which I think is common on this campus, but if we were to really break down what the South Asian or Indian um, student body looks like, there are quite a few people who are low socioeconomic status. And so think about who you're stratifying and think about who you're not letting into like celebrating culture. Um, I also think that ISA needs to do a better job in, while celebrating culture, talking about the different um, problems in the community, um, which we'll talk a little bit about um, deportation and um, status, citizenship status later, but yeah. So next I just want to talk about four student groups that need some work on inclusivity. Um, there's the Vietnamese Student Association, there's the Korean American Student Association, there's the Thai Student Association, and then there's the, uh, the Taiwanese American Students Club. Now I didn't, I really don't want to do this, but these are, these are four groups that I joined freshman year. I mean, I mentioned earlier, I wanted to find friends, I wanted to find a place to belong in. At least for these groups, one of the things I realized was they're really welcoming of you at the start, um, if they are, sometimes they aren't. But I realized once some um, these groups pulled me in, they kind of just stopped caring about me. They thought, oh, he's going to come to all these events now. We don't really have to try to get him to um, join or stay involved. But I felt that um, didn't really, wasn't, didn't feel sincere in my opinion. And. Um, I know when um, I was always supporting their events when I was a freshman, going to their events, um, telling people to come along. But then when it came time to um, when I was establishing the Laos Student Association, um, none of these people really even um, came to our events. No one really supported. Maybe there was a light amount at first, but then afterwards it just died off to those no support. So I just thought that why should I be giving them my time when they don't give them um, their time in return? And then. Um, what I've noticed about these groups are certain individuals are welcoming, so, but when it comes to the group mentality, that's when it just kind of falls apart. And with one of these groups in particular, I remember um, them telling me when I first joined that this is going to be your second home, your home away from home. But then um, when it came to sophomore year, I, uh, second semester was a time when I had, um, it was a low point, I guess. I was emotionally, and I had some problems that I addressed, or I talked to some board uh, member general and board members who I thought were my friends, who I thought I could confide in, but then you now talking to them, they said, uh, one of the board members said, I don't think you should be um, telling this to some of the members. They feel kind of creeped out. So I thought, oh, I thought you were supposed to be people I could confide in. Why, um, why can't I bring my issues when I have them? So I ended up kind of breaking away from that group. Um, that, this group took the longest. All of those happened sometime during freshman year, the other three. And then, um, I did give these groups these groups a second chance, but I mean the second chance really wasn't um, what I expected, and um, I still wasn't getting the tough acknowledgement or acceptance that I was wanting. And then um, with these groups now, I just um, don't really support them anymore because of past experiences, and I find it hard to kind of really at least with one of these groups. Even though I don't support the chapter here, I'll support um, their sister organizations at other universities. Because I know it, it would be very, it just doesn't make sense if I have beef with this school of um, chapters and have beef with other schools' chapters. Because some other schools, uh, their respective organizations, or RSOs for these actually um, do things right. So it wouldn't be right to direct my hate towards some people who don't deserve it. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how do we make social justice part of the narrative for these different organizations that we're talking about. So as a social justice educator, I find that a lot of the weight of addressing issues in our community falls on me. Um, because I am one person, I am one South Asian, I am one voice, and I cannot advocate for an entire subcontinent. Um, and I find that that's why it needs to be ingrained in the community. Like, if we have a stu Indian student organization, it needs to be ingrained within the Indian student organization to talk about social justice, and to talk about people of color, and then be an ally towards other groups like Southeast Asia. <coughs> um, we also found that the university does not adequately address South and Southeast Asian diasporas and communities. So the ethnic studies um, at UIUC offers a subset of South Asian and Middle Eastern studies, which is separate from East Asian studies. Like it's a separate section, but that's not reflected in like a cultural center or a resource center um, for Middle Eastern and South Asian students. And I feel like the biggest difference is that added layer of brown skin and the added layer of religious diversity that goes unrecognized at other, when you kind of lump all Asians together. And then yeah, I mean, I didn't know, I think when I was researching last year, I was very surprised that some schools have a center for Southeast Asian studies or even Southeast Asian American studies. And like, for example, um, Northern Illinois University, NIU has one, um, UW Mass has one. Um, it was just, uh, I realized that that's something that we could have here, but it just hasn't happened yet. So I still think there's hope for it, but I don't think it's gonna happen. It might not happen within the next few years, but eventually, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And then we also need better representation and diversity, like actual diversity of these boards of different organizations. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was my time working at the YMCA New American Welcome Center, which offers services in East Asian and Latinx languages, but none in South Asian or Southeast Asian <coughs> languages. And um, when I went to go work for them, I actually told them I speak four languages, and I speak Spanish, Gujarati, Hindi, Urdu. But they said you won't need Hindi, Urdu, or Gujarati because we're trying to help the more disadvantaged population. And I found that to be really problematic because if you actually look at stats in the United States, the TSA doesn't keep record of stoppages, but TSA behavior detection officers at Boston's Logan International Airport once told reporters that more than 80% of the passengers that they select for additional screening were brown. So you have this like uneven um, sort of like TSA checkpoint thing where like brown people are being stopped more, they're being questioned more, but the resources aren't being offered at the YMCA for people like that. And so there's a lack of representation, but there's also a lack of effort because clearly I was working there. Clearly I had the capacity to offer services in these languages. It was more so an idea of, oh, those people don't need it. Um, and then we're also talking about undocumented people in the United States. So there are higher levels of undocumented immigrants and victims of deportation that are South and Southeast Asian, and one out of seven Asians are undocumented. So in, in fact, if stretched back to 1990, India's unauthorized U.S. immigration growth far outpaces any other country, reaching 914%. Um, and they're actually the largest growing population of undocumented immigrants in America right now are Indian Americans. Um, we need more resources for this community from both within the community, which I was saying with our student org, but also from without the community, like from outside of the community, like um, the new Welcome Center at the YMCA. So next I want to talk about undocumented war refugees. So as of recent years, uh, Southeast Asian refugees are at least three times more likely to be deported on the basis of old crimes. And these are just, these can be sometimes just minor incidents like misdemeanors to felonies, but even then, um, that distinction isn't really made. They'll still deport anyone if they find something that doesn't seem right. Um, these are two quotes from articles. Um, the first one is about um, the Trump administration trying to deport um, this uh, Vietnamese war veterans, people who came here. Not too sure if they fought on the U.S. side or not, but they probably did fight on the U.S. side if they're here. So it's uh, there's about seven thousand of them getting deported that we know of that was reported in this article, which uh, came out during the last month or two. And on uh, um, the bottom is an article about um, Cambodians. Um, so this was this stat was from uh, last September, 2018, and this article itself was published in. I think March or this month, so 
both these articles are relatively recent, uh, and these aren't some these aren't things from the '90s or whatever. Some old uh, articles, and um, not only that, um, even Lao Americans and Hmong Americans and uh, this, these other groups of Southeast Asians are getting deported, and it's, um, it could be happening here. Even we don't even know about it. So um, next, we want to talk about wildland colleges, challenges for communities. So when I say mixed experiences, I mean the word mixed in more than one sense. So first, I mean it in I'm actually multi-ethnic, mixed in that way. So. I mentioned earlier, I don't really find the place that I belong in. I don't think, I mean, when I try to be Chinese American, people don't really accept me for, even though I'm knowledgeable about um, the language, the culture, um, that was what I was taught growing up to be. And still, even then, I don't, there's something about me that just doesn't click about the other, with um, other Chinese Americans for uh, some reason, I wouldn't know why. And then, um, being Lao American, there aren't really many of us on campus, so even when I interact with other Lao Americans across from the US, it's a very positive, they're very inclusive and welcoming. And that's, because of that inclusivity is definitely the reason why I've identified more as Lao American after coming to college and a Chinese American. And um, mixed, um, I think I mentioned this, but sometimes with student groups, um, it's just that I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's a, a hit and miss, well, mostly it's been a miss for me, but mixed nonetheless. And establishing a Laosian association, so this came from my um, desire in high school to start up an Asian American club. When I came to college, I wanted to find more Lao Americans and Southeast Asian Americans, and I was surprised that at our school there's a group for many of these Asian American groups, but Lao Americans, so I, I think it was just hard finding other people, and maybe every few months I'd find someone and every year I'd find a few people and, and we're still going along. Um, surprisingly this year, um, the freshman this year, um, there's a, a lot of Lao Americans so it's very promising. Maybe the new um, income um, regulations might change things, we don't, I'm not too sure. And um, taking AAS and AAS class and AAS class. AAS is Asian American Studies, that's my second uh, major. I love my AES class in the department. It's definitely allowed me to learn more about myself, but I realize some of those in my classes, um, Southeast Asian Americans aren't talked about as much as um, East or South um, Asians. And the mo most they talk about is whenever uh, I bring up the topic or I write a paper or some assignment that I focus, I have the ability to focus on uh, Southeast Asian Americans, which uh, I guess doing research has allowed me to learn more than I would have. Uh, um, otherwise, and um, uh, our department recently had um, a class of intro of um, Arab American studies. So, if they um, started that last year, I still hope that they can do an intro to Southeast Asian American studies since there are two professors who are Southeast Asian. So, it's uh, always a possibility, although I, we won't see it in our time here. Mm -hmm. And then, um, AAS class, um, American Indian studies. I took this class on first semester of uh, junior year, so the professor, is, I really love the professor. He's a really nice person. Um, we didn't really talk much during the class, but after the class, he's a very um, open person, um, very just available. I could go to his office and talk to him. He's become one of the professors I've been uh, very close to in college. Um, been able to go to him about academic stuff, personal stuff, and um, Taking his class, uh, one of the first assignments, I was able to compare um, Southeast Asian Americans, in particular Hmong Americans to Native Americans, and I was very surprised about the similarities, and I thought to myself, why aren't these similarities talked about more often? Um, we we uh, might have changed that possibly. And uh, because um, with student groups, I've kind of felt alienated. Um, I've actually looked to other universities for support, so there have been times where I just researched and lost an association at whatever university. And um, they've definitely helped me um, with ideas of um, how to maintain my organization, how to find members, the ideas for events. And um, even though some of these people are just very far away, they're not even in the same region of the US, I feel that the support they give us is 
it's just uh, it's beyond words. I'm just very thankful for them. Even though it's just like we some of them I only know through Facebook, not even not even having a chance to meet them in real life. But just amazing people that um, I learned that you know, I'm not alone in this. So maintaining an art, so especially for a lot of Americans, is definitely very difficult. So it's great finding solidarity from other schools. And um, sometimes I even talk to uh, my friends from other schools more than um, my friends from other um, RSLs here. And uh, yeah, um, interacting with non Asian American groups. This is something I've done more of um, this year. I realized that um, while it's great interacting with people who identify with me, I thought I was kind of trapped in a bubble. Um, my view of the world got slightly narrower and uh, and not interacting with other groups kind of, it made me less, um, wasn't really as aware about other issues. Um, and at least for me traditionally, I was, I used to interact with non-Asian American groups in them, uh, uh, high school and before. So I think that was just something that I really liked this year. And um, yeah, um, my last point is just realizing that um, there's, just more connections with Asian or uh, Southeast Asian Americans and uh, Native Americans than I previously beyond the scope of my AAS class. So, so the past year I've had a chance to go to the Native American house a lot. And um, I've known of them since sophomore year, but I haven't really had the time or sometimes I didn't know um, if I fit in or not since I don't identify as that group. But I think that um, the Asian American community can learn a lot from the Native American community. And, uh, in the sense that we should be more close-knit, um, we should be more supportive of others, but then again, it may, it may be hard to implement because our size is larger and our, our situations are a little bit different from each other. So, um, I wanted to say that since and also because I'm not always accepted in the community, I must challenge it. And solidarity can be shown in different ways. So in our community, we already have a lot of stratification historically. Like, this is why I have a picture of an Indian person with a Pakistani person with a Bangladeshi person. Like, there's a sharp divide between these two, three countries. And we've also seen in recent news how there's been like deaths of war, there's been bombings, there's been all kinds of stuff going on. So we need to keep challenging our community. We need to keep challenging each other to come together and like be uniform and like not let these differences stratify us. And I think being South Asian American adds another layer because not only do you like have these historical divides, you have like divides that have been created for us. And so trying to like recognize those and then move past those is really important. Um, and kind of a radical thought for the thought that I had <laughs> is that <laughs> reclamation may be rooted in separation. So like Tommy said, Asian Americans are a huge, huge, huge group. And I feel like it's very hard to see tangible change. As someone who's worked on this for two years and probably longer, um, I've constantly been trying to like reunite the Asian population and say like, hey, let's make sure South Asians are included in the narrative. Let's make sure Southeast Asians are included in the narrative. But it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. And maybe stratifying ourselves isn't the worst, po like, worst possible idea. So um, I think that maybe we need to be more okay with factioning the American view of being Asian or becoming Asian, you know? And that's not saying that I'm any less Asian or that Tommy is any less Asian. That's just saying that maybe we need to stop trying to unite everybody and focus on our internal problems and then sort of move from there because it's really hard trying to be the glue that holds all these communities together and trying to grab at every different identity and be like, come on Asians, we got this, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> um, and I think like reclaiming our differences, like South and Southeast Asia have deep, deep histories of colonialization, um, whether that's by like Britain or by China, different areas, like we reclaim our religions, we reclaim the empires that once ruled our lands, and instead of separating and dividing, we create a distinction. I mean, going off that idea, oh, I remember last year reading an article about um, oh, what was the data disaggregation and um, one of my friends argued that Lao Americans should be separated from Asian Americans as a whole. And I just thought that that um, supported Needy's idea even though I thought, uh, I don't know how feasible that is, but maybe. I think it's a line we're kind of like dancing on. We need to, we need to like, try different things and see what works, but I know right now trying to 
glue everyone together isn't working. We need tangible ways to come together. Um, so we have some like proposed changes. So just based on my four years here, some of the changes I want, I focused earlier that an intro to Southeast Asian American studies would be nice. It would teach people of at least of Southeast Asian background and non-Southeast Asians. Just uh, there's uh, the history, our history, um, it, it would bring more awareness, at least to the people who take the class and hopefully they uh, share the knowledge outside of the class to other people to create more understanding of issues, not just past issues, but contemporary issues as well. As well. And then um, I thought it would be nice if maybe Maybe not under this cultural center, but at least somewhere in the university, there's someone that's a Southeast Asian representative, like a counselor, someone who's a, of an older generation. I'm, I know if I had someone that I could talk to an older figure, it would have helped me understand being Southeast Asian American in college. I might have made some better choices or been more aware or informed of some things before um, I stepped foot in them. And, um, like I said earlier, I don't really see many people who I can identify with here, so a counselor would have made that issue a little bit, would have eased it a little bit. Then, like I said earlier, awareness of Southeast Asian American issues, tying along with the first idea, I think it could um, just make us more knowledgeable about one another's situations and um, um, take away from misconceptions that we have in groups. And um, a more accessible counseling center, so, I remember last year, what was it, it's um, one counselor in every 2,000 people. Um, you have to call the counseling center at 8 a.m. or right when they open to get an appointment or you might just have to wait for a long time. So yeah, that needs to be fixed. And um, more solidi solidarity within the Asian American community. So during my time here, it feels as though um, Asian Americans we're more interested in our own issues of, that um, surround our respective countries or ethnic groups, but when it comes to supporting other groups, it's, um, I don't really see it, at least um, when it comes to uh, supporting a lot of students, it doesn't really happen. Um, it seems like it's just we're more interested in our own issues, and when we come together, it feels like kind of a false solidarity. It's almost, it's um, solidarity in words, but not solidarity in actions. And um, more of solidarity with other ethnic groups. So I mean, the first step is we should Im we should uh, improve internally, but also um, after that we should improve externally. So I just bring this up because um, I remember when I think I was a sophomore or something. It was during an official. I saw one of my friends of Asian American wearing this uh, chief shirt. So I thought, oh, I don't know how to address that. I mean, I didn't know much about the issue then, but I thought. Mm -hmm. If we um, don't support other minority groups, it's, um, we're kind of bringing each other down without realizing it. So um, if we support one another, we can uh, try to somehow uh, change the um, systematic oppression that's just placed upon all the minority groups and um, working together versus um, just working separately. And um, not only student groups, but cultural centers as well, even the ethnic study, studies groups. If we work together, we can I think there could be a change. And um, I guess now that we're kind of moving to the final part of our presentation, so at least for me personally, um, yeah, well, <coughs> studying for the LSAT at the moment, so hoping to go into law school after this um, gap year. I didn't want to have a gap year. Parents are very annoyed about that, but <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, then, yeah, I still want to continue advocating for Southeast Asian Americans and Latin Americans. I guess I've just um, grown to be a person who likes advocating for uh, the underrepresented people. So it's a passion of mine that's been since elementary school. It will probably continue, definitely. I just don't know in what form or capacity as I get busier. And um, yeah, hopefully I, I can stay in the Midwest. I mean, Madison or, uh, Min or uh, Minneapolis, they're nice regions. St. Louis, maybe, and have a lot for St. Louis. <laughs> we don't know, hopefully, we'll see. It's all up in the air, it just depends on what school I get into. Uh, LSA plans, so looking for successors, um, because um, one concern is that this group will die off when um, my friends and I graduate. Um, we're mostly all, the board is mostly all seniors at this point, so looking for people to continue. So there's a few freshmen that are potential, so 
working with them, getting them um, more uh, accustomed to what leadership looks like and their responsibilities. And um, still, I still want to have a conference for um, well, Americans like uh, some other um, Asian American groups have. That'd be cool. And uh, although it won't be done in my time, it's something for the future. Um, and then some things that I wrote were learning that there is. I oh, you I was like, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Go for it, I mean, some takeaways that I have is just. Um, I guess um, some of the things we do on campus, we don't see the media effects of them, but I still think that um, all that we do, whether it's interacting with other groups of people or just going to these events, um, it's just showing that we're present makes a difference, or telling some, some person a problem. Maybe you don't think they um, hear the problem or it goes in one ear out the other, but I still think it's better to act than just to think about and um, not act. And, um, uh, learning not to assume things about people. This is from the misconception I said earlier about the experiences, the names, the, um, the appearances. I think assuming things could be very dangerous in many cases. So yeah, better not. Uh, just being patient with others. I know, at least for me, I've talked about how I give, I've give, given these groups multiple chances and um, just people multiple chances and uh, was patient, but. Sometimes it just doesn't work out, but you should still try to be patient. Um, yeah, networking with others is crucial and it's not hard. I know sometimes though, um, with me, when it's interacting with other Lao Americans, so all of this is it's an email or a Facebook message. The worst that could happen is they see the message or um, don't respond at all, but it's always worth a shot. Uh, and networking just helps in the future too. So um, it might seem like something social, but it can become very professional networking. Is. And, um, yeah, mental, the mental health struggle is real. We didn't really talk about that all that much during this presentation, but it's um, the counseling stuff too. It could be more accessible if um, the children of refugees or even direct refugees themselves. Um, we face um, struggles that really aren't mentioned or talked about, so there's not really a place for us to talk about them. That would be nice if uh, there's a space that we could talk about it. And. Uh, Cross-cultural connections. I mentioned earlier, I've, I've had interactions with the Native American House, even the um, LGBT Resource Center. They're just really friendly people, and um, the directors and the, the workers there are really friendly. And if you go stop by, it just you'll probably mean a lot to them. And I think you'll be able to make friends, even just learn some things that you previously didn't know about uh, these groups of people, and you don't necessarily have to identify with them. And um, if you can click with them and not identifying as them, that means that they've done something right and it's um, what we should try for. And uh, I realize that the Asian American community, I mean, we've been talking about this all the presentation, so it's, um, I didn't have my space, I didn't have a space, so I created my own. And um, I want to make that space a space for people who may, may have felt like me in the past. And um, I just want to tell people that there is, you do have a place on campus, um, just sometimes have to look hard for it or create your own. You don't have to go through college being alienated or isolated. You can change that. Um, I'm a Zoom TV, so the student orgs, South Asian orgs, need to play a larger role in advocacy um, for representation and diversity. The YMCA and New American Welcome Center needs more services in South and Southeast Asian languages and have like representation. Um, they also need marketing factors to get those people in the community to know that's a resource. Mm -hmm. More mental health support and representation in counselors. So having counselors that are all of your own identity feels better, like you're able to talk to them more easily, at least for me, for some people. So I think that's important. Creation of a specifically Middle Eastern and South Asian cultural center or resource center, I feel like that would be really impactful in terms of religious diversity and like racial diversity. More religious representation. There's really no place for me to practice Hinduism on campus. The closest temple is like in the middle of the cornfield, like 40 minutes away, which I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, so maybe like making more religious representation or a space for Hindus to practice. Um, and perhaps it's a distinction, not to tear apart the community, but to be deliberate in our discussions about being Asian. Um, so to close it out, we're just gonna say a little stuff about like what we're doing next and what you can contact us about if you want to. So I'm creating a podcast, it's called Model Minority. Um, and it's being released, released later this spring, 2019. 
Um, it focuses on the struggle of model minorities and their struggles to succeed in American society, and it debunks the myth that all Asian and African immigrants are successful, rich, politically quiet, and smart. Um, a lot of times I find that everybody assumes all the stories are success stories, but you don't hear the non-success stories. You don't hear the people who really struggled and still didn't make it. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to expose. So come talk to me to learn more. This is my email and this is my name. Um, yeah. So I want to plug up an event that my student group is having tomorrow. We're having a Sherlock uh, movie night. <laughs> <laughs> so we're watching a, a lot of American documentary called Bridging the Gap of Dreams, released in 2017. Um, just shows uh, some of the current um, status of wild Americans and across various um, regions of the U.S. And, um, yeah, uh, I think that um, yeah, the Law Student Association is a great opportunity to be learn about law culture, meet um, law Americans, um, also perhaps to identify as just anything specific or particular to join. We're very inclusive, and I mean, my leadership, the way. Um, inclusivity works it's just i've just learned from uh, my experiences with other student groups on how to maintain my own student group in this aspect so we're definitely very open um, we won't turn away anymore. Um, and then uh, yeah it's a great opportunity yeah. yeah and yeah come talk to me afterwards if you come want. talk to us yeah. thank you guys so much for coming and Like, if you're in one of these orgs, spread that news to the boards. If you're in one of these, like, different systematic things, like the YMCA or housing, like, spread it. Let people know. So, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for being here. Just a reminder, too, there are also evaluations.